Good afternoon. Um, let's, let's start the program. Um, my name is Jacob Kierkegaard, and it's a tremendous pleasure uh, on behalf of President Adam Posen and the Peterson Institute to welcome back uh, to the Institute uh, Commissioner Pierre Moscovici. And uh, as for what really is the last of a series of events here in the last couple of weeks about the economic situation in Europe. And as such, we really, I do believe, have kept the last, uh, the best till last. Uh, Commissioner Moscovici is commissioner for the economic and financial portfolio, but uh, importantly also for taxation and customs, which in light of recent revelations in Europe is probably one of those areas where we shall see more political uh, action uh, in the coming years. And as such, he's one of the key figures in articulating and implementing the new commission's policy to promote growth and job creation in Europe. And not least, which I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, this afternoon, putting some bones on what is meant by the new commission's proposal for a European Fund for Strategic Investment, or the so-called EFSI. Uh, program, which was just yesterday endorsed by the European Council. Uh, Commissioner so Moscovici comes to us with what I really think is one of the most impressive uh, uh, CVs in terms of previous government service that I can think of. He actually has direct experience from all three branches of government, having been elected to all levels of government. Uh, in the legislative branch, municipal, regional, national, as well as European uh, level in Europe. He has been a minister in the executive branch for, uh, until recently, of course, finance and economics, but also for European affairs in his native France. And he has uh, also been, arguably, a member of the judicial branch as a member of the France Cour des Comptes, or the Court of Audit. So there is no doubt that he comes with uh, a perfect understanding of the challenge that is now in front of him in his new jobs. He has, moreover, graduate degrees in economics, political science, as well as philosophy, and is a graduate of the uh, ENA school in France, and as such, is well versed in pretty much everything that we care about here at the Peterson Institute. Um, we look very much forward to hearing what the commissioner has to say. And following his address, we will have an open discussion with the audience from the podium. Commissioner. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, first, uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, I want to say uh, that it's a great pleasure for, for me to be here today uh, at the Peterson Institute. It's not the first time I'm in this room. Uh, at the conclusion of what has been a, a short but uh, also intense um, and productive visit uh, uh, to Washington for me. Uh, I took my role as the European Commissioner for, as you said, it's a very long title, uh, Economic Financial Affairs, but also Taxation and Customs uh, uh, Union, which is important because uh, it's the first time those two uh, portfolios are joined, uh, which is something ordinary in a, would say national government, but which was not the case in the Commission to, to work as well on resources and, uh, and on, um, on expenditures. And because both uh, constitute tools which are important for a growth uh, strategy in Europe. I, I took my role uh, just one and a half months ago uh, with the uh, Commission. Uh, and I was very keen to make my first visit to, to Washington as Commissioner before the end of uh, this year. Why so? Because I, I know that there is real concern about uh, the economic situation in Europe, and it was confirmed by uh, almost all the meetings I had here. Um, I know there is a sense that uh, Europe uh, has not done enough to, to put its own house in order, uh, has not been ambitious enough to reforming its economies, uh, has been kicking uh, the uh, can down the road, or uh, somehow muddling through. Uh, I'm well aware of those uh, perceptions, even if I do not uh, necessarily agree with them or with all of them. And let's be honest, they are, are not surprising. The uh, economic news uh, coming out of Europe has been bleak these uh, past few years, and particularly these past few months. Uh, that's uh, precisely what I wanted to come to Washington as early as possible to 
to set out the new um, Commission's uh, European Economic Strategy to, to people like Caroline Atkinson, uh, Jack Lou, Janet Yellen, uh, Christine Lagarde, and, and, and this afternoon I will also meet Mike Froman, uh, all of whom uh, I already knew well from my time as a finance minister of France, which just expired a few months ago. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to also set out that strategy here uh, for you or with you uh, today. Uh, my message to you is uh, uh, very simple. We are addressing our economic challenges with, I think, a renewed drive, uh, with vigor and uh, with determination. Uh, President Juncker has said, and I've echoed this uh, sentiment, that this is Europe's last chance. He calls us the commission of the last chance. Uh, what do we mean by this? Uh, we mean that this is our last chance uh, to make our young people once again uh, see Europe as a source of economic opportunity, of social mobility, uh, and of hope. For, for my generation, uh, for someone like me, uh, said what was my CV, uh, I was born of uh, Jewish parents who, who spent, uh, uh, for my father, the first years of their life in, in Romania. Uh, my mother was from Polish origin. Uh, they, they lived in, in, in an incomparably darker period of our continent's history. Uh, Europe meaning for them is a profound and obvious one. I was born in 1957 with uh, the, the idea that uh, reconciliating the French and the German, reuniting Europe uh, was uh, an historic uh, tool. And uh, I also felt when the Berlin Wall fa fell, as uh, somebody, a son from Romania and Poland, that enlargement was an historical achievement. But well, uh, this is for my generation, and for, for the generations of those who are here. But by contrast, uh, for most young Europeans today, and uh, notwithstanding this year's uh, terrible developments in Ukraine, uh, peace, stability, open societies, all of this is taken for granted. And it's not enough uh, to talk about peace, about democracy, about unity, about reconciliation. They don't care. And in a way, they're right, because uh, the other generations fought for that to be uh, granted. Uh, these young people, they look to the European Union instead to, to offer them um, economic growth, job opportunities, uh, geographical and social mobility. And many of them, after this long and painful crisis, are deeply disillusioned. They are disappointed. They don't believe in it. And again, I see that they're rightly so. I was, uh, before coming here in Washington, in Athens, on Monday and Tuesday, maybe we'll have the occasion to speak about Greece further on, uh, but why should a, a, a young girl from Greece under 25 or a young Greek man under 25 with a, an unemployment rate of 50%, uh, why should a pensionee from Greece who has seen his pension cut, it was maybe too high before, that's another point, uh, why should they stay? Uh, well, Europe is fantastic. They don't. And uh, in a way, they're right. It, there's no mystery in the rise of anti-European parties in Europe. There are causes. As long as we don't deliver results in the economic side, then we'll feel that the European project is in danger. And we could see uh, this clearly in the uh, European Parliament elections last uh, May, when uh, populist uh, forces and extremists of both left and right uh, squeezed the pro-European parties, uh, though fortunately they emerged with a clearly workable majority. But let's imagine five years from now, if we are doing business as usual with uh, the low growth, low inflation, high unemployment that we see today, uh, there won't be a majority in the next European Parliament, and there won't be any drive for the European project. This is why we are truly the Commission of the Last Chance, to add and to begin to reverse this tide, to, to rebuild confidence in the European project. Uh, we need to deliver. Uh, the economic policy responses that our citizens, not only the youngsters, but also workers, are rightly demanding. Uh, if we do not, uh, the European Union risks losing the support of an entire generation, and uh, the European project, uh, I think, could, in a way, uh, as we know it, die. Uh, so, uh, first, let's start with the economic outlook. The uh, European economy is gradually, I would say, 
emerging from the uh, protracted crisis which began in 2007. As our uh, autumn economic forecast published last month indicated, uh, the recovery is there in uh, Europe, but it remains uh, fragile and vulnerable to external shocks. We need to act decisively in, in order to avert the risk of a period of stagnation marked by low growth, low inflation, high unemployment, and high level of inequalities. Uh, in short, I share the sense of urgency and the analysis uh, conveyed by Mario Draghi in his Jackson Hole speech last, last summer. I know that it is uh, somehow controversial, but I feel quite close to uh, his uh, point. Ladies and gentlemen, my view of uh, economic uh, policy making at the current juncture is that we have to think in terms of uh, risk management and uh, security margins. We cannot simply count on a, a spontaneous recovery which would at best be characterized by disappointingly low growth. At the same time, we must not risk reversing one of the main uh, achievements of the recent years. I speak about the stabilization of the Eurozone uh, through uh, credible fiscal consolidation and financial repair uh, in a context of very high as well public and private debt. Uh, our challenge today is to kickstart economic growth in Europe without reversing the stabilization. And that's not easy because for some people there could seem to be there a contradiction. In this context, let me uh, underline two uh, encouraging developments which constitute the starting point uh, upon which we have to build. The first development is the um, comprehensive assessment of the Eurozone banking system by the European Central Bank and of the wider EU banking system under the um, uh, coordination of the European Banking Authority. One of, of the main results which were achieved those last years is the foundation of a banking union. Uh, it seems technical to a lot of people. It's not uh, even explainable to them, but I think it's as important as any kind of development since the beginning of uh, the foundation of the euro. Uh, this has provided us with a clear picture of the soundness of the European banking system that is, um, of course, a precondition for a sustainable recovery in credit to the real economy and thus for investment and growth. The second development uh, is the fact that the aggregate fiscal stance in the Eurozone is now broadly neutral. In other words, uh, fiscal policy is neither being tightened, as it was, with the risk of a recessive impact, neither loosened, uh, which I think would uh, get back to even more debt. This reflects, in the Commission's view, it's not shared by everybody, uh, an appropriate balance between sustainability requirements, which we still follow, and the current weak cyclical conditions, uh, which we have fight. Uh, now, I, I will not escape uh, uh, from a point. It, it, it does not escape to your attention that the Eurozone is, is some way uh, from being a fiscal in union. We may need a, more time on that one. As such, maintaining a neutral uh, fiscal stance in the Eurozone as a whole while some member states are being called on to increase their efforts to comply with the Stability and Growth Pact, namely uh, France, a country I know best, Italy, uh, Belgium, uh, uh, well, it implies also a degree for, for, of fiscal support coming from the exploitation of the fiscal space available in other member states. Uh, in our uh, draft uh, budget's opinion with uh, Commissioner Dombrovskis, we named Germany. So I can do that here uh, again. So how does the Commission see the way forward for the European economy? Uh, to move decisively in, into a phase of strong and sustainable recovery, we need to work in parallel on three fronts. Uh, first, boosting investment, then uh, accelerating uh, structural uh, reforms, and finally, promoted uh, fiscal responsibility uh, through growth-friendly uh, fiscal consolidation. Uh, le let me talk, take you, you through uh, fastly those uh, three priorities in that order. First, boosting investment. Europe is suffering from a, a large investment gap, uh, which has been building up for many years now. Uh, this gap is both the consequence of, of past low growth and a possible cause of future low growth. Action uh, is thus needed uh, now to break that vicious circle. 
The size of the investment gap is uh, hard to assess with precision. But what we know is that investment in Europe re remains around a fifth below its pre-crisis levels, which is not obviously the case, for example, here in the US. And if it goes on that way, uh, at the end, uh, the Europeans will play in second division, which is not acceptable for the uh, first or uh, one of the first economies in the world. Uh, as a member of the French Parliament until uh, November, I had the opportunity before the summer to, to work on the assessment of this gap and on possible ways to, to close it. My conclusions, I'm happy to say, were very much in line with what the Commission is now putting in place. Uh, I, 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 I called there for a Europe of investment. We need to build that Europe of investment. Addressing the investment gap means at the same time fighting against the lack of aggregate demand in the short run and preparing higher supply capacities to lift potential growth in the medium to long term. Uh, it is therefore good policy for both today and tomorrow. This is important to, to underline given the, the strong heterogeneity of uh, economic conditions in the Eurozone today. Some countries clearly uh, face uh, primarily uh, demand constraints, others mainly structural, supply-side challenges, and many face both at the same time. A, a successful strategy for investment in Europe must follow some uh, simple principles. Uh, these are the followings. First, it needs to target additional projects. The point is not to finance projects which would have, one way or another, be financed. Second, it needs to be timely. We have a sense of urgency there. And this is why the Juncker plan is for three years, not for ten years. Uh, and three years means a quick start. It needs to be focused uh, or targeted on, on areas where long-term investment for the future is required, networks and social infrastructure. And it should rely on private money when possible and on public money when necessary and aim at crowding in, not crowding out private funds. The Commission's investment plan uh, for Europe, which uh, you know received the strong backing of uh, EU's uh, heads of state and government meeting uh, in Brussels yesterday, constitutes, uh, I think, a determined and decisive answer to these challenges. It is based on, 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 on three pillars. First, mobilizing finance. Uh, it means that using EU-level instruments in a new and smarter way uh, to boost strategic investment through the creation of uh, the new European Fund for Strategic Investments, which I think will be capable to, to bring confidence to uh, investors by, by taking a large part of project risks out of the equation of helping riskier uh, projects uh, to find private financing. Second, uh, making finance reach the real economy. Because the point is not only about finance, it's about projects. Uh, this plan must be project-driven. Uh, through a stronger and more transparent pipeline of projects uh, supported by technical assistance. And third, I won't talk too much about that, uh, improving the uh, investment environment by removing non-financial regulatory barriers in our single market. The backbone uh, of our investment plan is to make smarter use of the money uh, we have because more debt cannot be the solution. Uh, we are confident that the design of the new fund uh, means that the $21 billion in euros in guarantees uh, provided by the EU budget and the European Investment Bank will enable us to mobilize more than 300 billion euros, uh, 315 uh, precisely, in additional investment in the next three years. And I can assure you uh, that if more needs to be done to support investment beyond that time horizon, and I think it is the case because, uh, in my view, the investment gap is much wider than 300 billion euros, uh, we will be ready to act. We are also encouraging member states to, to build on this by contributing their own national resources to the fund in the form of capital and guarantees, and this will be included in the calculation of the deficit or debt, or it will be used against them uh, in case of procedures. Uh, but financing is only uh, one part of the uh, investment story, albeit an important one. Uh, again, uh, what we need to, to show is that uh, uh, we uh, must have 
profitable projects, which implies action at the macro level and at the micro level. Uh, second point, uh, and we'll be faster for the last two points, is about uh, accelerating structural reforms. Action on the micro level means stepping up the pace of structural reforms by uh, both the European Union itself and by its member states. The European Commission will play its part uh, on both fronts. At the EU level, uh, the new Commission uh, is determined to, to close the persistent gap that exists in the single market. Among our priorities are the creation of a genuine a capital markets union, a digital single market, and an energy union. And these are precisely the three sectors where we want to be privileged in the investment plan. And let me say uh, very clearly to you that while Europe uh, is putting its own economic house in order, we will uh, remain open and outward looking. Uh, as I said uh, this afternoon, I will meet uh, Mike Froman at his demand. A major priority for, for the, the coming year will be to make decisive progress on TTIP, the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. It was also said yesterday in the conclusions of the uh, European Council. Uh, we all know that concluding such an agreement uh, will not be easy. Uh, we've got uh, history there to remind us that, uh, well, there are some reluctances which has to be raised, uh, but few goals that are worth striving for are easy to attain. And, and, and with the tremendous growth and employment opportunities that it promises to unlock, TTIP uh, is a goal uh, worth striving for. I can assure you that all the member states now uh, feel really uh, committed to the conclusion of the TTIP. When it comes to our member states, uh, the responsibility for structural reforms lies with the national uh, government, uh, and, and there is, must remain. But in an economic and monetary union, where the impact of economic policy uh, decisions does not stop at the national border, there is a need for coordination of uh, those reforms efforts, and it is legitimate for the Commission and for other member states to uh, make their views now known without being uh, overly uh, prescriptive. We share common goals, we uh, share common rules, uh, the member states have their own sovereignty, but we must move the same direction, although we have different challenges or problems. A true friend and partner uh, is one that gives frank advice and constructive criticism. Uh, I said that in Greece, for example. When we see progress, we will applaud it. Where we believe reforms should be more ambitious, we will say it. That's how the Commission and myself, we see uh, our role uh, in the economic governance of the Eurozone. And I see, as I said, my role as Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs, Taxation and Customs as such. It is about supporting and persuading and not cajoling or punishing. Uh, for, for too many people in Europe today, Europe seems to be not a promise but a constraint or a punishment. Uh, it doesn't mean that we must not keep our discipline, but probably we need to, to have a, a greater work on conviction of the people, conviction also of the government, that reforms is good, not only because we decide that in, in Brussels that's not the case, but for them for their people, for their economy. I end with uh, some ideas to promote finance fiscal responsibility through growth-friendly fiscal consolidation. What does this mean? At the macro level, uh, what we are seeking to promote is fiscal policies that, that keep public finances in, in a sustainable path in view of the already high debt levels and the looming impact of uh, demographic aging while doing more to support growth. That's the new element. We are extremely conscious of the need to support the recovery. Uh, the EU's fiscal framework provides flexibility uh, to ensure that fiscal targets reflect economic conditions, particularly through uh, their emphasis on, on the improvement in the structural budget balances. The Commission will be uh, making important announcements in January uh, concerning how we intend to apply that flexibility in a smarter and more effective way. And my contacts here in the US suggest that it is uh, expected, not only in Europe, but also here abroad, as well in the uh, uh, American administration and in the institutions uh, of finance, which are established there, and maybe uh, on very prestigious uh, think tanks 
like yours. Uh, so we need to ensure that our common fiscal rules are respected so that it remain an anchor of stability, but we also need a part of flexibility. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to conclude then. Uh, the new European uh, Commission understands that the risk of economic stagnation is real. Uh, again, we feel, uh, as the Commission of the last chance, we will do everything in our power to ensure that this risk doesn't materialize. Uh, that's why boosting growth and job creation is our number one priority. Not only our number one priority, our only priority uh, in the economic and social field. Uh, President uh, Juncker has put together um, a team, which is, I think, different from uh, uh, previous ones, not only because uh, there are new members, uh, but because I think it's strong, it's more political, it's dedicated, uh, and he arranged that team in a way that is innovative uh, and designed to foster coherent decision-making within the Commission. This new setup is working well. Uh, furthermore, the European Parliament, uh, with its so-called grand coalition uh, of conservative, liberal, and social democratic forces, I'm a social democrat, is proving to be a solid and constructive uh, partner. Uh, since taking uh, office on uh, November the 1st, the new European Commission um, has, I think, hit the ground running. Uh, a credible yet ambitious investment plan, I spoke about that, is on the table. Uh, stru structural reforms uh, are being supported and driven forward using all available tools. We have shown that we are committed to taking a balanced approach to uh, fiscal policy choices, focusing in parallel on growth and sustainability. We're also uh, addressing some situations of high importance and sensitivity, such as Greece, uh, as Ukraine, as Russia. Maybe we will discuss about that. We have a job to do together, and that job is to improve the lives of our citizens so that they see, again, Europe not as a source of interference and a constraint, but as a source of prosperity and very simply as a hope. I'm not speaking as a dream, uh, but uh, I think of that very uh, strongly. For me, at least, that will be my guiding principle over the coming five years. And now, uh, thanking you, I'm ready to uh, have an exchange with you. Thank you. Well, Commissioner Moscovici, let me thank you, first of all, for those very forthright <coughs> and informative remarks. And then let me immediately proceed to misuse my prerogative as chair uh, and ask the first question. Um, and it goes to the, to the issue of, of boosting investment in Europe, where, which is obviously uh, the, uh, formed the nucleus of your talk and was also the main topic of yesterday's uh, EU Council and of course uh, sort of yielded the new uh, fund for strategic investment. And um, <clears throat> my question is, you mentioned it yourself, that there is a whole host of barriers to uh, investment. Some of them are financial, but I guess I would say that when I look at the balance sheet of private businesses and the availability of credit, interest rates, et cetera. It doesn't seem to me that the, that the barriers are predominantly financial, uh, which leads us into non-financial investment barriers. Uh, and you, you mentioned that, you, that the Commission had, had uh, identified a number of priority sectors. For instance, the energy union and the digital uh, single market. And what, what can the Commission, uh, uh, in, in, in your opinion, what can it, what should it do to work directly on reducing such non-financial investment barriers. And just to give you an example, I mean, if you take the, the, the energy union, one of the key uh, issues there would be the lack of cross-border connectors in, in power uh, uh, and the power and gas net in Europe. Is that, which has again something to do with regulatory environment, environmental concerns, etc. Are those types of uh, uh, issues needed to be addressed if this fund is, is going to have to have, uh, have the ability to attract the kind of private investment that you're looking for? No, certainly, uh, uh, as I said, the, the, the strategy for investment is uh, threefold. Uh, first, it's about finance. 
uh, and I believe just as you, that uh, it's a very important part of the story, but not the whole story, and maybe not the main problem. Uh, the idea of the fund is to help uh, projects which would be too risky to fund financing uh, to uh, be uh, capable of coming to life. Uh, the second uh, part of the strategy is about the, the having the finance go to the real economy, uh, meaning uh, that this must be project-driven. Uh, I saw that some governments said, Germany, we have 85 billion euros of investment plan. Uh, France, 55. Uh, Italy is good too, 50. But the problem is not uh, to know whether the project is uh, French, Italian, German, Greek, Slovenian, uh, and so on and so forth. The problem is, is it a project which is mature? Uh, is it a project which is useful for the European economy? And uh, is it targeted on the various uh, objects which I mentioned a few moments ago? So uh, the governance of the fund will have to be project driven. And the third point is the one you mentioned, is about raising some uh, non-regulatory uh, barriers and it is to, to, to comfort the, uh, the uh, internal market. And there is a clear linkage between the action of the fund uh, and uh, the uh, single market and, and structural reforms. Uh, I mentioned a few examples. Uh, today, when you look at energy, uh, we, we say we've got a single market. That's true, but there are 28 uh, national markets. We don't have the same structure. We don't have the same uh, dependence or independence. We don't have the same sources. Uh, and there are there uh, obvious barriers. Same for digital. S same again for finance. Uh, again, the banking union to me is a major achievement of uh, today's uh, European Union, especially in Eurozone, but also uh, uh, in a broader network. And uh, this is why the, the investment plan is not only about the, the financial package, but it's uh, also about those uh, structural reforms that needs to be led. I I'm not the Commissioner for Energy or the Commissioner for Digital. Uh, there is a coordination between all of us. Uh, I, I, I mentioned the structure of the Commission. Uh, it's good in my, in my understanding that there are Vice Presidents who are not uh, bosses of the, commissar, of the Commissioners, but who have a role of coordination, especially as far investment and growth uh, are uh, concerned. And so we have to take a decisive action on that plan, point. It also means that some investment must be cross-border, and you mentioned some of them, and I think that kind of infrastructure project uh, must be uh, also clearly in the framework of the fund and the investment plan that are uh, supposed to be designed. You mentioned also in your speak uh, Mario Draghi's uh, famous Jackson Hole speech, which basically articulated the need for both a fiscal, monetary, and structural reform response uh, in Europe. The question then immediately springs to mind about the macroeconomic policy coordination between those three areas, which of course in the euro area are, you know, some of it is national, some of it is with the ECB and, and Mario Draghi himself, which is probably wise for an unelected uh, public official, goes out of his way to say that there is no grand bargain between the different uh, actors here. But at the same time, I mean, the Commission uh, seems to be in a, in, a, in a good position here because you actually have a set of tools, namely the Stability and Growth Pact, which of course includes um, uh, the possibility of sanctions. Uh, uh, and my, my question is there that as you look at the new framework for defining flexibility uh, under the Stability and Growth Pact, shouldn't there be a more explicit uh, link between that one of the things that makes growth, uh, makes fiscal consolidation growth friendly is if it is in fact uh, jointly implemented together with broadly agreed structural reforms so that the, the, the policy coordination is achieved in that way. Uh, as you know, we've, we've got a whole lot of procedures included in what we call the uh, European semester. Uh, there are some excessive deficit procedures, some excessive debt procedure, although it was never used until now. There is a macro imbalances uh, procedure, um, which is less constraining uh, for the time being. Uh, and uh, we have a, uh, an overview, which is included in an annual growth survey. And so we want to have a co coherent and cohesive view 
of all those uh, procedures. Uh, first, to come to Mario Draghi's uh, speech in Jackson Hole, what is the originality of the speech? That it, it, it shows that we need to have a strong monetary uh, policy action and probably an accommodative one. Uh, the, the, the target of uh, the ECB today is clearly to, 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 to reach uh, an inflation rate which is much over 1%, uh, which is around 2%. The, the target is mentioned by Mario Draghi himself. But it, it's good that uh, the, uh, a central banker uh, mentioned the broader view that there is not only monetary policy, but that there is also fiscal consolidation being growth friendly that there is also structural reforms in order to have more competitive economy and that there is investment. It's the four, four corners uh, of a square which creates uh, growth uh, tomorrow. And I believe that uh, there is, of course, a need for coordination there. We've got uh, some institutions uh, that are capable of uh, being the place where uh, this coordination applies. I think about the Eurogroup. And there, I would say that I think that in the future of the European Monetary Union, we'll have to rethink and to enhance the governance of the Eurogroup. Personally, I said that as a finance minister a few months ago, and I still believe that as a commissioner, but it's personal view. It's not the view of the commission there. Uh, I believe that there should be, uh, of course, a permanent uh, president of the uh, Eurogroup, which at the same time could be the Commissioner for ECFIN. I'm not a candidate. It will probably be for the next uh, round. But uh, in the future, I think we should have that. Uh, and there, the Commission would be placed where it has to be, at the center of the commutary method. Uh, right between now and five years to come, we can make some practical and even institutional arrangements. Uh, I think that we also need to have a, a, a coordination between those member states who share the euro in the European Parliament, uh, establishing something like a committee, and lastly, that we must think about the, the fiscal capacity for the eurozone. Uh, but, well, again, uh, the Commission as it is, in the Eurogroup as it is, uh, with the tools that are uh, at our disposal, that we are going to improve, uh, with, I said, the communication and flexibility, with the investment plan, with the broader view, uh, with maybe a, a, a simpler reading of the two-pack and six-pack. I think those tools are recent, that they go the right direction, but that sometimes uh, they need to be simplified or clarified. Uh, then the Commission is ready to play its, uh, its role, and I myself uh, feel uh, dedicated to that. The floor is open, and we should, as usual, take the first couple of questions from some of our guests before turning to our internal staff. Krishna? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Very interesting presentation. Uh, delighted to hear the sense of urgency. Uh, may I push back a little bit, reflecting market skepticism that what's currently being contemplated meets that test? So I think a lot of people take the view that, first of all, there isn't sufficient political appetite for the moves into deeper institutional integration and policy coordination that would be needed to deliver a really effective response. And secondly, and more specifically, that the investment plan that you describe is very unlikely to deliver anything like the uh, amount of net additional new investment uh, that is claimed of the 315 billion. Could you speak to both of those questions, please? Uh, as far as, as in institutions are concerned, uh, there are two uh, time scales for action and also to two dimensions. Uh, first, we need to improve uh, the, 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 the functioning of the present institutions without any treaty change. And we can do so, uh, pragmatically, and we must do so. And we are going with Vice President Dombrovskis to reflect next year on the future of the EMU. Uh, we've got a common basis, which is the report of the four presidents. Um, it, it's a common approach now today that the Commission should have the leadership uh, it's, it's recognized by uh, all members of the uh, European Council, in which, of course, uh, the uh, Commission is, is present. Um, and some of the uh, better approaches, which I spoke about one minute ago, can be taken without treaty change. At a further step, 
uh, we will probably uh, need to have treaty train changes. It's not the end of the story. Uh, we need a union which is more integrated uh, politically. We need a stronger governance of the EU. And we will need probably treaty changes. The problem there is that uh, it must come at a point where there are results. Uh, maybe there are contradictions be because some could say we need treaty changes to have results. Uh, we probably need to have results to have treaty change. What's, why so? I come from a country, namely France, uh, which said no uh, to a referendum a few years ago on uh, the constitutional treaty, and there is no appetite for that, neither in parliaments, uh, neither uh, in, uh, uh, in the people's mind. Uh, so uh, we need first to convince. So let's first improve our institutional tools. Then, in the end, we'll have probably to change some treaties to, to move further. On the second point, uh, I understand that part of criticism, or we'll say skepticism. Uh, and uh, to be honest, some of the people I met here in Washington uh, share that view. Uh, they, they, they all believe that it's a positive step, uh, that it's something which was unprecedented in European history, that it represents a breakthrough, clearly, but they wonder whether it can deliver uh, new investment at the level uh, which is foreseen. Well. Let's see how it works. Uh, of course, we believe uh, that it can be done. <laughs> the gentleman in the back. Thank, thank you, Jacob. Um, Commissioner, my name is Sean Donnelly from the U.S. Council for International Business. Um, thank you very much for your remarks, including on investment and your strong endorsement on TTIP, which I think was very well received. Um, I wanted to ask you about taxation. There's a lot of controversy in Europe about how multinationals are taxed. Some of them obviously are American, some of them are members of my association. Um, and there's work underway in the OECD in the so-called BEPS project. You have any comment on the substance of the matter, but also where this work should be done? I mean, the UK seems to want to go off and do it unilaterally. Should it be addressed as a, as a community thing or, or in the BEPS, uh, in an OECD-wide? How do you see moving forward on, on that issue? Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I, I, I welcome and support uh, for years uh, the, 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 the work done in OECD and the BEPS initiative. I was a finance minister of my country, France, for two years. And we, uh, uh, when I say we, a uh, few ministers uh, around the table, uh, Wolfgang Schauble, the Italian minister, the Spanish minister, the British minister, we took common positions supporting BEPS. And I think the, 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 the right framework in order to, to, to act there is clearly the G20 framework. Uh, in all G20 meetings now, uh, maybe it's the most useful part of the G20, I must say, or the more effective part of uh, the G20. Uh, we uh, take decisions. Uh, for example, one which is very important, which is to, uh, to make the uh, automatic exchange of information a global standard. And there, I must say also thanks to the US, because the FACTA uh, approach was decisive uh, in uh, the breakthrough, which leads now to the end of banking secrecy as we knew it, I would say, in all developed countries. And this is quite interesting that now we uh, are all in this approach, and that, for example, the Union, the European Union, is discussing about agreements with countries such as Switzerland, Monaco, uh, Liechtenstein, uh, San Marino, and they will be concluded uh, in the months to come, I'm sure. I will be visiting Switzerland in a few months. I had several talks uh, when I was finance minister and now again as commissioner with uh, Evelyn Wiener Strumpf. The banking secrecy will also uh, end uh, in Switzerland in a few uh, years from now. And, and, and that's a whole symbol of something which is uh, really changing. So we'll be involved uh, in, in that field. And uh, I think the G20 uh, is, is really the global framework where we can work on that. But of course, everyone has to do its own work. Uh, as a taxation commissioner, uh, because it's also part of my portfolio, I will be dedicated to, to the fight against tax fraud, tax evasion, and uh, the implementation of the BEPS initiative uh, in the union. Uh, you know, of course, the, 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 all the press about the, the so-called LuxLeaks, and I must answer that, although the question was not directly uh, raised, but maybe it's also on the table. Uh, when you, you suffer from such a blow, you've got two responses. The first one is to say, okay, I'm wounded, 
are not acting. And the second is to say, well, this is an opportunity. And Jean-Claude Juncker and, and myself, we think that's an opportunity. This is why this commission will be uh, active, uh, will be in the front line, and wants to be an example in the fight, uh, in the fight against tax erosion, tax evasion, tax fraud. Uh, and this is why we, we will advocate for transparency. In the very first months of 2015, I will present a proposal for a directive uh, establishing the automatic exchange of information on tax rulings. It doesn't mean that we want them to disappear. We want transparency. And in transparency, you mentioned some of uh, the members of your association. Transparency is necessary and good for everybody, whatever the activity is. Nobody has to fear from transparency, because when you fear transparency, that your practices uh, are against the ethics. Uh, again, it, the, the point is not to, 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 to say that there won't be any tax rulings or any kind of practices, but everybody can know what is the action, uh, how function, trust, and so on and so forth. Uh, I had uh, yesterday breakfast at the AmCham. The, uh, the idea is not to be anti-business, but the idea is pro-transparency. And though the European Union wants to be a leading actor uh, in that field. And that's clearly the mission that I have. We'll see then how member states react. Uh, let's take the example of the directive. Well, uh, my ambition is that nobody can say that the commission was restrictive because that or this. Okay, after that, if a member state wants to be restrictive, we can name him. Because I, th I think that on that point, we've got the public opinion support. Uh, the people cannot stand anymore practices of the past that lead individuals or companies, because they're really wealthy, to avoid uh, taxation while modest people cannot and don't want it because they're citizens. Uh, we all need to, be, uh, to have a, a citizen behavior. That, again, doesn't mean anti-business, but citizenship. Anders? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, my name is Anders Osler. I'm here at the Peterson Institute. I would like to ask you about Ukraine that you mentioned a couple of times. And of course, you can't tell us how much uh, money possibly the European Union can put up. But I would like to ask you about process and uh, uh, time frame for possible um, uh, support. At the end of this year, probably Ukraine will down, be down to seven billion dollars of reserves, which is awfully little. The IMF is going out in January. Then you will hopefully have uh, an agreement for a basis of. Uh, of action sometime mid uh, uh, January or perhaps slightly later. How can you act them for macro uh, finance assistance? Is there any frame that you need to stay within, or is this a freely decided decision at the time by ECOFIN and uh, the Council? And how fast uh, do you think that you can have a, a donor meeting and really go ahead and provide? money if Ukraine, of course, fulfills the condition. Thank you. Uh, th this, this was a, a, a large part of my uh, interviews here in Washington, uh, of course, especially with Christina Gard, but also with uh, Jack Lou, for example. Um, we all feel that uh, Ukraine uh, is a country which needs to be helped. We all feel that after a, a slowdown in reforms, now we've got to a government which is in capacity, which has the will to reform. Uh, and so we want to be supportive to this government. Of course, if there are reforms, the reform process must go on. Because the idea is not to, 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 to finance the public administration in Ukraine. The idea is to have a development of the economy in Ukraine. Third, uh, we uh, know, well, we share or could share a common evaluation of what the financial means needs are. Uh, the figure of around 50 billion, 15 billion euros is, I would say, uh, globally accepted by all the partners. Then the question which relies is the timetable and uh, who pays what and how. Uh, for the timetable, I think it's reasonable to consider that we need to have a decision in January, and we uh, are working to have that by January. Uh, who pays what? Then it's a bit different because there are some differences, but we'll have uh, to have a global discussion between all partners. 
the American administration is very much involved in that, but the European Union too. Uh, each of us are, 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 has its own budgetary constraints. The Union has also budgetary constraints, but it was discussed yesterday in the European Council, and I understand, and Mr. Ambassador told me, uh, after a briefing that this was a clear priority for the European Union. We'll have to take our decisions, of course, in the European framework and not on our own. Uh, yes, thank you. Alex Briotero with ASCGS. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner, uh, for the presentation. I wanted to go back to the um, issue of flexibility and uh, would like to ask you if you can uh, give us a sense of uh, uh, how this flexibility will actually be uh, interpreted once uh, once you uh, propose uh, some more concrete steps in, in January. Uh, it seems to me that you know you are quite happy with the fact that uh, we are in a now fiscal neutral stance and uh, you wouldn't want more fiscal tightening because that would be contractionary in a sort of weak and fragile uh, in a recovery environment. And yet, uh, you know, some of the countries that you cited, uh, France, Italy and Belgium specifically, uh, would have to present uh, some kind of updated uh, plans uh, by March um, because they have some shortfalls. <coughs> uh, at that point, I, I just wonder how you can square it off because those countries have already declared that they don't see uh, the need to, uh, to, to do more. Uh, and you uh, yourself seem to be sort of quite reluctant to ask them to do more because that will be nature be contractionary. Uh, so how do we sca square this circle? And uh, would the promise or actually implemented structural reforms by uh, those individual countries be enough, uh, in your view, uh, to basically uh, meet the standards and uh, get a clean bill of health in March when you review those budgets. Thank you. Uh, you, you will understand easily that I um, will answer cautiously uh, this question uh, because uh, it's an ongoing process, because we have discussions to lead with those countries and because it will be a collective decision which is not easy to take. But to start with, of course, yes, I think that it's, it's better to have a neutral fiscal stance than uh, uh, a tightening. We cannot have now a contractive or recessive impact of fiscal policy. As I said, we need to have fiscal consolidation as well as a growth-friendly uh, approach to uh, this uh, fiscal uh, policy. Second, uh, the point is uh, not for me to be uh, reluctant or friendly. Um, I've been accused of many things. The, the, the worst one is to be French. Uh, I happened to go here 10 years ago. I can see that it's work in progress. Now it's good to be French. In Washington, it was maybe not the case. So maybe once it will be good to be French you're also in the European in, you're Union. You're also, also in Iraq now, don't forget. Sorry? You're also in Iraq, in Iraq now. Yeah. I know. That's another point. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, so, so maybe it will be good once to be French in the European Union. I hope soon. Uh, no, but without uh, that kind of joke, uh, my point is that today I'm the European co Commissioner and I have to be very uh, objective. Uh, my role is to be the warrant of the rules, not the one who has a creative interpretation of the rules or the one who destroys the rules. But it's not forbidden uh, to make a, an intelligent use of the rules. And there are flexibilities inside the rules. Let's take a few examples. Uh, now, uh, the, the rules are taking into account the national situation of the member states. Second, we are talking mainly about structural efforts, not only about nominal targets. And third, we can take into account particular conditions, macroeconomic conditions, as well at the level of the Eurozone of, or at the level of a single country. And uh, also we need to have the definite data. This is why uh, uh, we've been criticized by some uh, to, to have taken uh, decisions which were not really clear but Italy, France, and Belgium, they are. Uh, doing something else would have been hasty, uh, one way or another. I consider that sanctions inside the European Union, uh, I'm not talking about uh, sanctions outside, of course, uh, are always a failure because, as I said, uh, being uh, efficient in the Commission means convincing, convincing a country to make reforms, and convincing a country to have structural efforts which are sufficient. So I will lead uh, uh, a patient 
and constructive dialogue with the three countries you mentioned. My idea is it's better to avoid sanctions. It's better for us, it's better for them. But again, uh, the sanctions are at our disposal. And it must be clear that we are also on a firm attitude. If we wouldn't, we wouldn't have neither the structural effort, neither the structural reforms. This is why uh, we will have that discussion uh, in a friendly, constructive, but also a very firm manner. Uh, I don't consider that it's just enough to say uh, that there is a bargain or a trade-off between uh, the structural reforms and then you do what you want in the fiscal side. No. Uh, if there are structural reforms necessary, uh, additional, they have to be done. So we need to have a very objective assessment of that. Uh, or else uh, we will be accused, and rightly so, to have a double treatment for those who made huge efforts and for those who, for some reasons, I know well, maybe their size, their power, uh, are accused not to do it. So, again, uh, there I will have to be first objective. Uh, the uh, last point I wanted to, to mention is that when we're talking about communication flexibility, it means that with Dombrovskis we are thinking uh, of the way, uh, for example, to have an investment plan uh, can influence uh, the uh, design of our uh, procedures uh, due to the SGP. Uh, there is a new element there. Uh, we want to prioritize investment. We cannot uh, act as if it's not important when we come to uh, fiscal procedures. Sorry, I cannot be more precise. But I think I was understood by you. Yes, such uh, as yours. Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics. Um, a question on TTIP. One of the most sensitive things I, is the inclusion or not of financial services in the agreement. Um, how important is it for you personally that that financial services regulation is included in the agreement? And what's your sense from your meeting with Mr. Froman this morning about whether they're willing to give ground on this? Uh, first, this meeting is this afternoon. And second, I'm not the uh, Commissioner for Trade, so I will leave Madam Malmström answer on that. She's a negotiator. <laughs> um. Okay. Now we'll, we'll take the, the you, you next. So. Me? Mr. 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 Co no, yeah, okay. Mr. Commissioner, I wanted to ask about the financial engineering of your 15 to 1 leverage of the investment fund. You're going to get more than 300 billion euros investment out of 21 billion. Uh, is is this going to be basically an insurance uh, approach? Uh, and is there going to be fiscal accounting for the expected losses? What will be the nature of the, of the leverage that is driving your big impact? Uh, or is there sort of a hope that it will, you know, animate animal spirits and that there will be sort of uh, new investment once some projects are begun. I just want, I'm trying to get a better sense of how you achieve the, the magnification of the public money uh, to get the uh, private investment coming in. Uh, Vice President Katanin, I imagine, will come here and deliver a roadshow. Uh, but uh, uh, this is conceived that way. Uh, on, on, on the basement, we've got a fund. Uh, the fund uh, has a capital uh, which is created of 16 billion warranties on the European budget plus 5 billion coming from the uh, EIB, the European Investment Bank, which will be uh, the place where the uh, European fund is hosted. Uh, then uh, it can be added by some national uh, money. Will it be? I don't know. But uh, the, the commission there is ready to consider some flexibility for the countries which can take part in the capital of the uh, fund. Uh, second, the fund then will borrow on the market. And we, we hope, we expect, that's not too ambitious, that there will be leverage or multiply of three. Then with that, we'll take a part of the risk on some projects which are too risky to find financing. And the calculation is that there is a new multiplier of five. That's the way uh, things are foreseen. And uh, again, I believe, 
but we'll have to see that by experience, that those targets can be met. Hi, um, this is Anna Yukonana from Reuters. I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about Greece. Um, you mentioned that's one of your priorities. Um, do you think that with the election of the Syriza party, which may happen next month, if there's another risk of contagion to the rest of Europe, or, or if not, why are we not seeing another Grexit um, threat 2.0? And also, do you think the European Union should extend the maturities for the Greek debt that is owed so far in the first program? Thank you. Um, I'm not so much the what-if guy. Uh, I mean, I'm, I never consider plan B uh, before the moment comes. Usually when you consider plan B, that means that you don't believe in you know, plan A. So uh, I, I won't elaborate too much on this or that. But I, I want to say something different. Um, as you said, and as I said myself, Greece is among my first preoccupations. And this is why I was in Athens Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I met Prime Minister twice and the most important members of the government there. And I tried to deliver a message which is the following. Uh, I think that the Greek situation is improving drastically. Uh, the, the efforts made by the Greek people sacrifices made by the Greek people, uh, and reforms led by the government uh, are considerable. They are considerable on the fiscal side. Uh, we must remember that in 2009, the deficit was something like 15%, that now it's 1.6%. Like next year, we will reach a balance that there is a primary surplus in Greece, which is the second largest in the Union after Germany. And they did that with the construction of the GIDP of 27%. Needs some efforts. Sacrifices by the people who feel that they really suffer a lot from what was imposed, not by so-called austerity, but by the fact that the economic and social model of Greece was not viable if there were no reforms. On the structural side, we are less, uh, less impressed, I would say. There are structural reforms, but the implementation sometimes is doubtful. Uh, and we shared that view uh, with Christine Lagarde and with Mario Draghi. That's the work of the Troika. We believe uh, that there is a way now uh, that with some more structural reforms, with a reasonable but ambitious set of structural reforms, we can have, without uh, drama and before the end of the extension of the program, a closer of the review than the end of the program and the opening of a new stage in our relationship with a credit line from the European Union and with a preclusionary program for the IMF, which would mean lighter surveillance. This is, I think, the virtuous circle in which we are. Uh, I went to Greece. I refused to intervene in the electoral process. My point is not to say that I favor this party or another party, this coalition or another coalition. What the Union wants is Greece in the Eurozone. I think it's of common interest for them and for us, and we want a pro-reform-led policy. Of course, the Greek people will have to make their choices. I think that's viable. I think that's the best way for Greece, for Europe, and for the Eurozone, and for Greece in the Eurozone. Let's see. But of course, there, there's politics there, and it's not under our control. I don't know under which control or whose control it is, but we'll see whether there is a president or not. If there is no president, then we'll enter into another situation that we'll have to consider at this moment, but only at this moment. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Jacob. My name is Randy Henning at, at American University. Uh, Commissioner, I wanted to kind of return to the question of how you might introduce greater flexibility into the administration of the Stability and Growth Pact, and in particular, whether uh, flexibility can in be introduced by adjusting the method by which the Commission calculates long-term potential growth uh, in the various economies and thus the structural uh, budget deficit. Uh, doing so, of course, is a favorite, of, uh, favorite proposal of our Italian friends. Uh, who think that the Commission's calculation for long-term growth for Italy is too low. 
Um, but this uh, same argument might apply to other countries as well. This, uh, and this argument was made just yesterday here at the Institute uh, by Carlo Cotarelli. Could you tell us how much scope there is for doing this um, kind of legitimately? Uh, uh, I'm afraid I cannot add much on flexibility because I yet delivered a few answers on that. And we'll have a communication on January, which needs to be uh, as well prepared and then adopted by the college. Um, I see that the Italian lobby is very efficient everywhere. It's efficient in Brussels, it's efficient here in Washington, and I, really I want to congratulate them. Uh, but uh, the, I, I must say the French lobby is less efficient. Uh, and I'm not a member of the lobby now because I'm a commissioner, so uh, I can only speak sometimes of the country I know best. It's hard to name it, but I still know it. Uh, but. Uh, I had this uh, question raised several times. I was in Rome last week. Uh, I was this morning in the Euro IMF meeting, and uh, the chairman asked me about that. We are open to, to, to discuss on methods, but after the March, the March exercise. We, we'll, we need to work now on the common basis which were agreed for everybody. So we'll have first to see what the decisions we have to take uh, concerning as well uh, Germany, uh, the France, uh, Italy, and Belgium, and then after that, maybe we'll come to a more theoretical approach. I'm not impressed, but maybe not totally convinced by uh, the Italian arguments. I think you'll get a question from the Italian lobby now. So, um, <laughs> please identify yourself. My name is Paolo Mauro. I'm a new senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I frankly find it a little offensive that you refer to the Italian lobby. I think that's inappropriate in, in an international institution. However, I will just point out on that technical issue that the OECD has potential growth for Italy of 1.4, and for reasons that no economist understands, uh, the European Commission has potential growth at zero, which I think makes no economic sense whatsoever. Uh, first, I thought that humor was uh, admitted everywhere, uh, including the Peterson, and it was not my view to be uh, offensive at all. Uh, nobody can love Italy more than I do, and what I admire, the way they uh, plead for their cause, which is efficient. Uh, my friend, Pierre Carlo Padoan, is uh, very gifted for that, and I can receive friends from Italy, calls from friends from uh, everywhere, from the European Parliament, National Parliament, government, etc., etc., It's a good job. That's what I meant. And I still admire that, and I think that's the way things have to be done. You know, I come from a country who is not well known for being efficient at uh, uh, pleading its cause or advocating its cause in the uh, uh, international institutions. I criticize my own country, my own fellow countrymen, French, for, for being sometimes too arrogant towards uh, uh, European institutions or international institutions, considering that being French uh, was enough, was just enough. Well, the Italians uh, today are really efficient, and uh, I, I wanted to, to really uh, welcome them for that. And let's not think that it was any kind of offense that wouldn't be true. But still, my answer is the same I after March. I think we have time for one more question. I have one, if nobody else springs forth. And it, it, is that a question in the back, or is it a stretched arm? Okay. All right, my, my question uh, goes to perhaps another type of flexibility uh, than the one we've discussed so far. And it, uh, <coughs> it comes to, uh, it concerns one of these political, medium-term political issues that will come up in the next, uh, or during the life of this commission, and quite likely uh, in the next couple of years. And it, it, it goes to the role of the UK uh, in the European Union. Um, is it uh, your opinion that the uh, European Commission, and of course in particular in the area under your responsibility, uh, which of course some of which are of keen uh, interest to the UK, that some flexibility should be exerted uh, to perhaps facilitate uh, that a political process in the UK uh, 
uh, results in a, shall we say, in what, in my opinion, would be the favorable option of the status quo. I didn't ask you whether we were under Chatham's rule or... Well, no, this, is, this is on the record. It's on the record. Uh, so let's hope that Great Britain stays in the, EU, uh, stays in the uh, European Union. All right. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I can say a bit more uh, without being too, too, too blunt. Uh, first, the status of the UK is special in the EU. There are numbers of, uh, of doubts which are equal to, to no other country. Second, uh, there, there is a limit to opt-outs. The limit to opt-outs is what puts in cause the uh, fundamental freedoms of the European Union. And you know, there is a debate about, uh, for example, uh, the f free movement of, uh, of the people themselves. There is a limit there. Uh, third, uh, of course, when times come, we'll have to consider some demands but we are against any kind of Europe à la carte. And four, uh, if they ask for my experience, a referendum on Europe is very dangerous, always. As a Dane, I can uh, attest to the truth of that statement. I think we had a quick question. So if you're the, Dane, yeah. Dutch, or French, you know about that. We can probably and consolidate. I don't know if the British will learn about that, but I think they should be uh, conscious of the difficulty of what it means. And uh, it's not up only to the other members of the European Union, to solve the problem. We must do that together. But again, I really hope that, uh, and I think that UK's place is clearly in the Union. If you have a couple of more minutes, we just ha actually have two more questions, I see. Is that okay with the timekeepers? Okay, we have first here and then Andre. Please be brief in asking the question. Yeah. Very short. Uh, I go to the introduction with I, which uh, I really uh, share with you, uh, the fact that we have to hit the young generations because uh, there is not a lack of trust in what Europe has been done up to now, but what Europe can offer now. Uh, all the projects that we are talking and discussing now are projects of consolidation, etc., things that have an impact in the medium term, to be optimistic. What uh, is the Commission thinking uh, uh, on quick impact projects in order to give a response to the younger generations that now are questioning their future, th their life future uh, in the next five, three, five, ten years in Europe? Thank you. We'll just take the next question as well before you answer. I'm Ajay Chopra from the Peterson Institute as well. I think the situation that the euro area faces with monetary policy that is constrained at the zero lower bound suggests that fiscal policy needs to be much more stimulative. You talked about fiscal policy being neutral. My view is that that's just not appropriate for the euro area circumstances right now and that what you need is an aggregate expansion. One can argue about you know, what that number should be, 1%, 2%. But why isn't there a discussion? I mean, the discussion seems to be about flexibility at an individual country level, while Europe needs an aggregate fiscal expansion in these circumstances. And the, and the leveraged investment plan is just not going to do it. It needs to be on balance sheet. Would you care to comment? You should come at the EU group and try to convince some of the members there. <laughs> uh, that's the correct answer. Uh, some, some of us try sometimes. And it's, it's not totally easy, I must say. Uh, so when I say that the neutral fiscal stance is appropriate, you know, this is not shared by all members of the uh, uh, European Union. And it's, it has not been endorsed by the EU group itself last week. Uh, so it's the view of the Commission, uh, which I think a progress compared to the past. And I think a positive or uh, progressive attitude comes if you consider other ones possibly. And I'm not naming anybody, as you may see. Um, for the rest, uh, I'm always cautious about the idea that we can have strong, immediate answers. Because we've been disappointing so many people by promises that cannot be kept. Uh, when I was in Greece, of course, I know that Syriza is a party which is influence is raising. Why? Because people feel disappointed about Europe. The youngsters, the workers, those who made sacrifices, etc. Uh, 
and I was asked by, by journalists then, okay, it's the reform process is good, but people don't see it. What can you do now, tomorrow? And I'm afraid there is no uh, answer about what can we do now, tomorrow. Uh, the, the correct answer is, relies on what I said before, to have a determined action, as well on the monetary side, on the fiscal side, as growth friendly as possible. On the structural reforms, which must not be uniform, but which must be adapted to the challenges uh, met in all member states and lately to investment plan, which I hope will be a success and which in my view is, is a first step. I think it has to be extended uh, in the future. It's not once for all. Uh, it's 300 billion euros now in the three years to come. But as I said, uh, we need to act timely, uh, meaning as well the reforms, the investment plan. We cannot wait for too long. Uh, if you see the investment plan, uh, when Jean-Claude Juncker uh, uh, was searching for the approval of the European Parliament, he said we will present that uh, three months after the uh, installation of the Commission, which I mean end of February, uh, end of January. Then uh, when the Commission itself gained the approval of the European Parliament, he said before the end of the year. And the day we came in the Commission, he said three weeks. And we need really to be fast on that. Because, uh, you know, to, 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 to put in place 315 billion euros, let's admit that this will be the case, of new project on the ground, on three years, we need to start really now. So I think that we, we, we see what are the parameters of what we have to do. We need to be determined, we need to show will, uh, unwillingness, but uh, I, I don't see any magic situation for tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, correct to acknowledge that. Because if not, then we enter in a vicious circles when we make promises that we cannot keep, and then afterwards the disappointment is even worse. So let's move in a determined way uh, in a growth-friendly uh, policy uh, and global one in the European Union. That's what this Commission thinks, and that's what I personally am committed to. And thank you for the welcome here. Commissioner Moscovici, thank you very much for your candid remarks. <laughs> We do not wish you to be late for your meeting with uh, Froman, and uh, we wouldn't want to keep anyone uh, here any longer than they would. So uh, we look forward to seeing hopefully you back in the next year and everyone else back as well for the next uh, event here at the Peterson Institute in 2015. Thank you very much.